Welcome everyone to our first Russellville Chamber chat. My name is Dana Caldwell with the with JTS Financial and I'm the Chamber Board Chairman for 2020. Um, our guest speakers today are Congressman Womack, Clint O'Neill, who is the Executive Vice President of Global Business of the Arkansas Economic Development Commission, Edward Haddock, the District Director for Arkansas District Office, of the U.S. Small Business Administration, and Chef Blanchard, who is the president of First State Bank and also the co-chair of our board uh, for Russellville Chamber of Commerce. Today, we are presenting an update on the CARES Act, including answering a few questions that have been presented to our small business, have been presented by our small business community. First. I want to acknowledge Jimmy Street on behalf of the chamber. Mr. Street has done a great job navigating these new laws and hosting a weekly call for our community the last couple of weeks. It has been very refreshing to see our community and those across the nation band together to help each other during this time. Just a few housekeeping um, issues that we need to get addressed before we get started. Today's presentation will be live on our Russellville Chamber Facebook page. Um, if it will be recorded and also available on demand for viewing following the event. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, um, please just type them in through the comments section of our Facebook page and I will try to bring them up um, to get them answered if time permits. Now, without further ado, uh, we'll begin with Congressman Womack speaking to an update of our CARES Act and relative legis legislation. All right, thank you, Dana. It's uh, great to be with you today. Now, let, just in honor of the event, the fact that we're doing something for my hometown of Russellville, I'm gonna pull this camera down a little bit so you can see that I am sporting the cyclone here today. So um, welcome, welcome to one and all there in the Pope County area. Uh, I'm gonna be very brief. As, as you know, when the whole coronavirus issue began to manifest itself in our country, the Congress of the United States basically has done three things so far, three different uh, tranches of assistance. The first thing, that we did was we passed uh, many weeks ago the coronavirus preparedness and response supplemental and what they did what they did was that it, that set in uh, play the initial tranche of testing support treatments and in, in, in the investments that we were going to make early on in vaccine development and this sort of thing uh, so the resources provided for that initial tranche were in that coronavirus supplemental early. Then we came back and did number two, the family's first piece of legislation, which was more or less designed to address the impact that was going to happen Im immediately uh, on families with regard to uh, uh, testing, who, who was going to pay for the testing, the paid sick and family medical leave piece of this, uh, the emergency nutritional as assistance, um, and, and some other issues. So that was the family's first package. But the big one was number three that um, we voted on um, uh, a few weeks ago, and that was the what we now affectionately know as the CARES package. And that was the, the two plus trillion dollar uh, funding package that has addressed a number of things. Uh, notably, and the one that I think we're going to get a, a, a lot of questions about today is the Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP uh, that was uh, formulated under the um, un, under the jurisdiction of the Small Business Administration, and we will be talking extensively about that. That was about three hundred and fifty billion dollars of the two plus trillion dollars of money that was committed to fight the coronavirus uh, issues. Now, sad to say, it is so popular that the account now has been depleted and uh, our leadership, the Republican leadership in the House, has asked for a pure $250 billion plus up 
to that uh, PPP program. And we thought that we might have an opportunity to do that by unanimous consent this week and allow that program to continue to flow unfettered. However, uh, because of some political uh, partisanship going on, uh, the fact that uh, members on the other side of the aisle, and I'm talking specifically about the Senate because that's where these discussions were taking place. They wanted more money for state and local governments and more money for hospitals, even though we haven't even pushed all of the money out yet out of the original CARES package, and that muddied the waters uh, and there was no agreement. So the Senate adjourned on Thursday. They'll come back on Monday without resolution to the PPP plus up. Uh, unless and until we are able to move more money into the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, we can't get any more loans approved. Although I think, and we'll hear from Chip and, and maybe Clint and others that, that have some uh, eyes on this issue to see how the banks actually are treating uh, additional applications for these Paycheck Protection Program loans should the money, uh, anticipating that the money is going to be there. I think that there will be more money for the program. It is too popular not to replenish it. Uh, but again, it hasn't happened as of yet. And so we're kind of on hold uh, through this process. My guess is if it's going to happen, it's probably going to be done next week. Now, let me, let me say one thing about um, the protocol that will take place if it's anything like what we did before in the original CARES vote, and I don't think it will be much different, the Senate will likely approve it by unanimous consent, i.e., in other words, the senators don't have to go back for the vote, and then it will be presented to the House, and the House then would consider it under unanimous consent, and my guess is, just like the last time around, at least one member of the House uh, and I don't have any problem naming him because he's uh, he, he he's he owns the issue. Thomas Massey out of Kentucky, a Republican, objected to the unanimous consent request. He felt like that the Congress needed to come back to Washington and vote, have a robust debate on the issue and then vote on it uh, because enough members were able to get back, myself included. We had enough members in the uh, chamber on that particular day to be able to have the chair overrule that a quorum wasn't present because a quorum was indeed present and it could go by unanimous consent. So my guess is, I say all that to say this, next week if we are presented from the Senate another $250 billion, my guess is some of us will have to go back to Washington, constitute a quorum so that again, the chair can overrule an objection on the floor and we can get that money uh, into the Paycheck Protection Program. There are a lot of other programs out there, uh, economic injury disaster loans, the EIDL program, also under uh, SBA. Uh, there are uh, more traditional SBA 7A loans. There, uh, there are issues, there, there are loan programs um, uh, that are housed under the Fed. I mean, there's, there's a variety of things that are designed to help the, the local businessman, the small business, keep his people on staff, continue to give them a paycheck, even though they don't have revenues, uh, and we'll concentrate our discussions on that as we go. Um, again, money going out to hospitals, money going out to universities like Arkansas Tech, uh, that's taken place already. Uh, and, and then we have still have some unanswered questions on ag. Um, there's about a $15, $16 billion proposal that Secretary Purdue is advancing. Some of that was uh, in the nine and a half billion that we set aside in CARES for ag. He's got some other money and other accounts uh, and just how those will go out uh, still remains to be seen, but uh, we can talk more about that. So, uh, but with that said, Dana, let me just stop there uh, and I'll be prepared for whatever questions come our way. And those that we don't have answers for, we'll take for a record and, and, uh, and get back to you or let one of the other experts uh, answer that uh, that they may have uh, some uh, some wisdom over. So I'll turn it back to you. You'll back my time. Perfect. Thank you so much, Congressman Walmack. We really appreciate you taking the time to visit with us today with that update on the CARES Act and where we are on potentially uh, replenishing the PPP uh, loan uh, funding. Um, with that said, uh, We'll go ahead and address some questions that we've had emailed to the chamber. Um, 
I just want to remind everyone, if you have a question um, and you are watching us on Facebook, even after once we present the um, recording, uh, feel free to type in the comments uh, a question that you may have or email one to the chamber and we'll do our best to get it answered for you. Um, our first uh, question that we had uh, sent in was uh, from a, a local business owner. We received the PPP funding. How long can our employees draw unemployment? They are only working part time due to lack of business. Well, the, the, the PPP program was designed in the CARES package to allow for businesses to continue to keep the majority of their employees on the payroll. Uh, and my guess is the reason you haven't seen unemployment claims any higher than, and, and they're pretty high right now, but higher than, than uh, otherwise is because we do have the Paycheck Protection Program that has allowed employers to keep them. So, um, so they'll need to return. If, if you have a PPP loan that has been approved for you, the employees that you may have furloughed, if you did, Need to re, you, you need to invite them back to work, and because they have been offered an opportunity to be reemployed, brought back to work on your payroll, uh, it is my understanding that they will no longer qualify for the unemployment compensation. Now, there's a there's a bit of an issue on unemployment that was unavoidable at the time that we voted, because there was not time for the Congress to establish. Um, uh, an unemployment compensation benefit that would be more targeted toward the actual employment cost around the country. They, they provided a $600 benefit, just painted with a broad brush and allowed what you would normally get in an unemployment claim plus another $600 a week. And we knew going in that that was going to cause a number of people to seek unemployment as a means to weather this coronavirus time frame, because it would be more financially advantageous to them to be on unemployment and drawing an extra $600 a week, which would be better than being back on the payroll, so to speak. Now, that is a limited time frame benefit. So as I have advised businesses before, you can invite these people back onto your payroll which would make them ineligible for future unemployment compensation as long as you keep them on the payroll. And those that decide they want to stay on unemployment do so at their own risk because, uh, as I said, they, they will no longer qualify for the un unemployment benefit if, in fact, they, uh, they have a job waiting on them at the present time, which is exactly why we established the PPP program. Uh, and, and that's Irregardless of whether you have an income stream, the PPP program is a loan that transitions into a grant uh, if, in fact, you've spent 75% of the money on personnel uh, and allowed for the other 25% of whatever your loan approval amount is can go to rent, utilities, and those kinds of things, other overhead costs. Hope that answers that part of the question. If not, we can come back and take another stab at it. Absolutely. I think that did it address uh, the concerns that they had in that particular question. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I think we've addressed one of the second ones with the PPP money running out um, in your uh, update. The next question is, if I've provided at least two weeks of sick pay or PTO, do I still have to provide an additional 80 hours sick time? And if I do, can I require them to use their existing PTO first? Okay, now this gets a little weedy, but uh, uh, as I understand the law, Dana, if you're an employer with less than 500 employees, you have to offer employees the additional sick time as, requir as required by that, remember that second tranche that we did uh, a few weeks ago, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. So if you got fewer than 500 employees, you have to offer employees the additional sick time as, requ as required by that particular act. Any employer uh, out there cannot require an employee to take existing PTO if the reason they're taking sick leave is due to the 
COVID-19 related reasons. Um, the employee and the employer might want to enter into a, 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 an agreement uh, to help supplement the employee's wages by using existing PTO. That's between them and the employer, but a, an employer cannot require them to take existing PTO if the reason that they're taking sick leave is due to the COVID-19 related um, uh, issues. Uh, now, there, I do have a number here that I'll give a, um, a, a phone number for if you want to write it down on the Department of Labor website, or you can contact my office and we'll be able to give you that contact information throughout the program as well. But um, the Department of Labor website uh, or uh, my office, 202-225-4301, uh, and, and our numbers are being answered, and, and we can roll those to Jeff Hempelman, who's my ledge director, and Jeff is willing to troubleshoot any of those programs that he can uh, to the best of his ability. And like I say, if not, we'll tell you we don't know, and we'll go find the answer for you. And I thought I saw something pop up on the screen that may have had some contact information on it. But uh, uh, again, the off, our office number is 202-225-4301. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, the next question that we've been asked is under the new EFMLA, how do I determine how many hours an employee should need and should be paid? Well, the, the Department of Labor has uh, laid out the rule that the average number of hours the employee was scheduled per day over the six month pending, uh, six month period ending on the date on which the employee takes the leave, including hours for which the employee took leave of any type. So again, the average number of hours the employee was scheduled per day over the six month period ending on the date on which they take such leave. Now that's how the hours for pay are determined. And again, I can refer you back to uh, the Department of Labor website should that be unclear to you, or you can again, call our office. We'll be happy to answer that. Perfect. Our next question, um... Do I need to include the new laws in my handbook or should I just create an addendum? Well, typically uh, you're required to put the new rules in a conspicuous place. Just have the information in a visible or otherwise conspicuous place that's re regularly frequented by your employees. And the Department of Labor does have posters on its website uh, for you to use should, uh, should you need those resources. And Dana, uh, I also to just note that uh, we have reached out to uh, Ardrina Lang uh, out in Little Rock, and she is our wage and hour division specialist here for uh, Department of Labor. So we've shared her contact information as well in the chat block, um, as as well as some links to the Q and A section uh, where a lot of these issues can be addressed directly with the business, and they can also reach out to that. Uh, community and resource planning specialist, Audrina, to get their individual questions answered for their particular situations. Because I know uh, the Congressman, I'm sure, has uh, got accurate information, but we also know that many times there's a lot of unknown factors and general questions that we get. So having a resource like that that can sit down with the business one on one and discuss their particular situation is also helpful as well. Absolutely. Thank you for that resource. Um, for those of you listening, uh, our chamber staff will um, key that information that they've just shared into the comment section on our Facebook page. And uh, those who are attending can view it in the chat box as well. Um, our next question, uh, if someone refuses to work because they are scared to get sick, do I have grounds to terminate them? Am I required to pay them during their refusal to work? Well, that's um, um, go back over that question again, because I want to make sure the reason that they uh, are not willing to come back to work. It says um, if someone refuses to work because they are scared to get sick. 
Okay, Why well, to terminate them. Okay, well, and, and I'm sure there are people out there that have some anxiety over going back to work because they may work in close quarters with other people, this sort of thing. But Arkansas has eased restrictions uh, on who can get tested. And uh, uh, so people uh, showing symptoms are able to get tested. Um, uh, others that in the testing protocols are being expanded every single day. In other words, we don't have the same issues with regard to testing for coronavirus that we had early on in the uh, pandemic. So uh, my guess is, is that within the next several days, the opportunity to, and, and particularly as we begin to reopen the country, obviously, as you saw in the phase one part of the president's plan, it does have a robust teching, testing mechanism in it with which to be able to satisfy the requirements in order for our country to to start getting back, but we have eased the restrictions on who can get tested. And now that there are more testing situation, you know, testing protocols available, um, I, I'm not real sure how prominent that's going to be as an ongoing issue. Maybe I'm missing something there, but uh, but I would think that uh, if somebody desires to be tested, that that they're going to have an opportunity to have that test. Okay. I don't know, Edward, you may have, um, you know, yeah, that's, that's, that's a good one because I think we have to dig in a little bit deeper on that issue as well, uh, is, you know, is there a reason that the employee is quote unquote afraid? Uh, do they have medical reasons? Uh, is, is there any limitation that is preventing them from coming to work or is it just, uh, you know, fear in, in the pandemic? So I think a couple of those would really need to be, uh, uh, discussed with the employer to make sure they're following uh, the guidelines that they've set out. Um, uh, if they are offering uh, flexible telework situations and all those others apply during this as well. So I would definitely uh, suggest that that employer reaches out and um, to the wage and hour division and make sure they know uh, their responsibilities under the Department of Labor standards and also what rights the employee has as well. Okay, perfect. Um, our next question presented, I laid off my workers, then I applied for the PPP loan. Once I received my loan, am I, once I received my loan, am I obligated to bring the same workers back? They are making more on unemployment and have indicated that they are not willing to take a chance on coming back until this virus is under control. Any ideas on how to get to address that problem? Well, just remember that the goal of the PPP program was designed so that you didn't have to furlough workers. And if you did, you could bring them back, those same employees. And as I said before, I know there may be some reasons why some employees wouldn't want to return to work. And we just talked about one of those, maybe the, the anxieties out there. And if reasonable accommodations can be made, then I'm not real sure that's, that's going to be permitted. Um, but you obviously can't force them to come back to work. Uh, I'm sure SBA and Edward, you could probably uh, expand on this, but there will be further guidance down the road on the forgiveness features of the PPP program uh, for the lenders and the borrowers in the near future. But my guess is, and my strong recommendation would be to document everything that you're doing. In other words, document any employees who are not returning to work uh, and make sure your lender uh, is aware of uh, the reasons they're not coming to work. Because at the end of the day, uh, the lender is going to be the final arbiter, I think, uh, on, on any loan forgiveness. So that, that would be the conversation that I would have, but document, document, document. Okay. Yeah, and and actually, uh, Congressman, I'll add to that. You know, there what what is out now for PPP forgiveness is um, out on the Treasury website. There's a fact sheet for borrowers that can get out there, and I think one of the the factors that the business really needs to uh, consider if they have received uh, PPP funds is that that rehiring. Um, you know. It, Obviously, this this program is still in development and is still in work. SBA is still going to issue additional guidance when it comes to forgiveness. Uh, but some of the forgiveness factors uh, really have been put out there. And, it, and it's to say commensurate with uh, your employee base prior to this um, uh, 
disaster and then what that reconstitution looks like. So um, if you are uh, dispersed proceeds on the PPP um, and you don't necessarily those for direct payroll, or you can't fully constitute back, then, uh, you know, those costs aren't going to be forgiven for the business. And I think that's what that uh, individual that receives the PPP loan needs to really look at is saying, can I reconstitute? How quickly can I reconstitute and make sure I'm using the funds that I receive through PPP to really uh, create jobs and, and, and pay payroll costs in my business to get back up and operating. So, Good points from from the congressman, and I would also check into the uh, the Treasury website. If you go to treasury.gov, uh, there's a big banner across the top that says COVID PPP resources. You can click on that banner and go to all the FAQs that SBA and, and Treasury have released on that program as well. Dana, we also have uh, Chip uh, on the line, and I don't think his his uh, likeness is there, but I think by voice he can be there. What are the conversations? that you're having with your customers? Yeah, um, I'd say one of the bigger questions to the point of rehiring, there is some concern from uh, employers on the ability to get their people back into the workforce. And Edward, I'll ask you this question. This is another one that has come up. You know, a lot of this is taking into account what the business was doing in 2019. So you take, for instance, a restaurant and their uh, payroll in 2019, which correlates to their actual loan amount for the PPP program, they were a full service restaurant. And so we look and they're going to take their loan at a time when, say it's a fast food restaurant, but it's a drive through only. And they absolutely know that they're not going to be able to have the same staff at that point. You know, some of them are nervous to take the full loan amount. How to, the, the application process is not really set up to make adjustments to it. I mean, it's all based on actual numbers from the past correlates to what their loan amount is. Have you seen any guidance on that or, or how they need to, as a business owner, approach that? Yeah, no, uh, you know, we really haven't. And honestly, I think that's part of the uh, the legislation as it was passed through. It it really does track that uh, post eight weeks after the uh, the loan is made and dispersed. And I know that is a great concern, you know, following CDC guidelines and reconstitution time frame. But we anticipate that SBA will uh, come up with uh, some additional guidance. Uh, really, it's it's in the uh, intent of the legislation to reconstitute and get these folks back to work. Uh, whether whether they're actively working or not, but keeping them on payroll is a component of that rather than them going into the unemployment system. So the business has, uh, you know, some some reasonable um, uh, responsibility and I would say uh, area to make some decisions on what would work best for them in that situation. Uh, but I would go back to the congressman's comments earlier, document, 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 and make sure you're keeping track of uh, those decisions you're making and, and the, um, the use of proceeds or how you're using that money just so you can make sure uh, you can prove what it was used for for forgiveness purposes uh, when all this does shake out uh, in the next seven weeks uh, before SBA really looks at that forgiveness component. You know, another question, and I've, I've, we've talked about it on other calls together, but yeah. when people obtain loan funding, in the middle of a payroll cycle, how do they need to document that when it comes? Because, you know, 80% of them are probably going to receive funds in the middle of a payroll cycle due to the time constraints and when the funding has to be out from the date that the loan's locked. So any suggestions on how they should be documenting that on the front end? Uh, you know, we've seen some best practices kind of uh, listed in, in many CPA journals. Uh, SBA itself has not issued any uh, specific guidance on that. Uh, however, it does refer to uh, using a, um, a payroll provider. Uh, so that's a, that's a good way to ensure that you're doing everything correctly uh, and you have all your information um, uh, available and contained in, in easy to access areas. So, uh, even if you don't necessarily use one, it may be advantageous for the business to go uh, so they have full and complete documentation of their payroll costs. Uh, additionally, that, you know, we've seen um, and, and heard many of stories of businesses open individual accounts, separate accounts, 
solely for PPP proceeds so they can specifically track each and every transaction uh, that they're using that money for. So those are the couple of things that, that we've seen happen and, and maybe uh, some good best practices for those businesses to look at. That was a great suggestion um, about being able to track the proceeds through a separate bank account. Thank you for that. Thank you for the response. Um, do y'all have any other questions re relative to that? Our next uh, question that we had received um, was how does the Arkansas Shared Work Program work? Dana, I can take that one. So as has been mentioned, uh, we're in an unfortunate situation where the unemployment uh, figures have skyrocketed to unprecedented levels. About 150,000 Arkansans have filed for unemployment in the last four weeks. The shared work program is a great fit for companies that do not quite have the capacity to keep all their employees uh, on the payroll, but it helps them to avoid layoffs. So just as the name, uh, indicates shared work is a system where a company can take either all or a portion of their employees and reduce their hours. Um, they have to um, have from a from a 10% to a 40% loss. So if you have somebody that's working 40 hours a week, they could go as low as 24 hours a week. Uh, what this does is it has a portion of unemployment insurance benefits that kicks in to pay for the hours that the employee has lost due to the reduction in capacity, but it allows the employer to maintain the relationship with the employee and it allows the employee to keep their health insurance. And after this period of reduced capacity is over, they're back at full speed to that relationship with, with their employer. So it's a program that prior to, um, around March 11th, when we had our first case here in Arkansas, uh, three companies around the state had used uh, in the last year or so. Right now, there's there's around 60 employers that are using this shared work program. So it's a great avenue to, to avoid layoffs, uh, to avoid uh, putting people on the UI roles. And so uh, I would encourage any company that's in that position to, to look at some additional information. I'll put some information here in the chat box. Uh, my colleague at the Department of Workforce Services, uh, Pamela Vance, uh, runs that program, and I'll put her contact information in the chat box. Perfect. That'll be very helpful. And uh, if anyone listening uh, would like some additional information, we can facilitate that as well. Um, our next question is, I've applied for my PP lo PPP loan. When should I expect my funding? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, each bank's going to be a little bit different on how they approach the process, but the date that you should expect your funding is going to be tied to the date that the application was actually approved and submitted into the SBA portal. So. It, the way the process typically works, uh, you know, customer comes into the bank with the application and then it goes to an underwriting of some kind. Once that application was actually submitted into the SBA system and assigned a loan number, the bank has 10 calendar days from that day to fund the loan. So whenever they receive authorization that the loan was expected, the loan has to fund within 10 days of that date. Okay, perfect. Um, our next question, it's uh, PPP and EIDL. Um, they're asking PPP or EIDL, which is best? Am I able to apply for both loan programs? If so, what expenses or are allowed if I apply for both? I'll go first just with basic information and I'll yield to Edward. He's, he can get down in the weeds on it, but um, it, it's going to depend on your particular situation, your business situation. The PPP program, as we've said repeatedly, is designed to kind of protect your payroll uh, during this particular crisis. Um, the EIDL is more for economic losses, hence the, the language on it, the, uh, the acronym Economic Injury Disaster Loan. 
Um, you can apply for both, but Edward, is my, it, it is my understanding and the intent of Congress that you can apply for both, but you can't use it for the same reasons. So um, I'll let you dig down in, on that subject just a little bit more. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, and just a quick update, both of those, uh, both of those programs are on pause right now due to lack of appropriation. We've, we've completely run out and, and uh, I'm going to let you all hear it first. Uh, now I haven't even gotten a chance, uh, my team to send out the press release, but uh, we've got Arkansas numbers in from Paycheck Protection. Um, so nationwide, uh, 1.6, uh, um, million loans were were uh, approved over the the past uh really 16 days uh, about 14 days total uh with over 342 billion dollars uh being committed to the program uh using 4,975 lenders across the country under paycheck protection which is phenomenal if you think about it that's uh, basically uh, something SBA would take 14 years to normally do in our traditional appropriation uh, has just been done in 14 days. Uh, Arkansas alone, uh, we had 21,754 loans approved for uh, businesses, nonprofit, and eligible entities here in Arkansas for a total of over uh, $2.722 billion. Some fantastic numbers, and I think that really speaks to the, the, uh, the work that our community uh, lenders have, have really done over the past 14 days. Um, working with SBA to make sure their borrowers, their customers were, were supported. Um, you know, the, the rollout uh, was quick uh, and it, I wanna say it went flawlessly, but uh, I, I know we've had some challenges. Chip can definitely attest to that and we've worked together uh, in a, you know, the, really an unprecedented public partnership to roll this type of funding out. Um, so we can kind of see the, these funds um, really meet the need and the impact of businesses across Arkansas. Now, when it comes to paycheck protection uh, and those PPP loans, those are used solely and really meant to protect paychecks in small businesses and those eligible applicants, the 501c3 nonprofits, the churches, the institutions that are eligible to apply for that. So really that program is, is really intended for payroll. And if you're not a payroll based company or you don't have a company that has payroll, then there's other options. And that's generally what the EIDL could be used for. Now, the uh, expansion of PPP and really the expansion of the SBA loan for the independent contractor and the sole proprietor helps protect their paycheck instead of sending them into unemployment benefit insurance. So that individual sole proprietor that says, hey, I've got wages I need to protect that's a great option for me. As opposed to the economic injury disaster loan, where if a business necessarily has inventory, it needs to get on the shelves, but doesn't have the cash flow coming in because of the COVID restrictions, that's where the economic injury disaster loan can be a great fit. So you really can apply for both of the loan programs, but for different, what we call use of proceeds or the different reasons that you need the cash for. Economic injury will help support those uh, overhead costs, the inventory costs you may have, or, or other factors that may go into production runs for, for goods or services. Um, that's really what the intent of the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program is for. And that's going to be amortized up to a 30-year period at 2.75% interest for nonprofits and 3.75% interest for small businesses. It is a longer term product and helps businesses survive and get back on their feet. Now with the paycheck protection, that's really gonna be a shorter term use of cash. It's that immediate need to get these folks hired back in and paid without necessarily bringing the cash out of the small business. And if the small business or eligible applicant uses it for payroll, it will be forgiven. So that's really a direct for uh, immediate need to help support payroll right now in a business for the next eight weeks in a business. So and if not for, and, and if not forgiven on the PPP program, Edward, uh, a one percent interest rate on a two-year two-year loan and a two-year amortization. So when we look at that, and and there's even an option in the PPP to refinance your uh, your idle loan if you did receive one. However. 
you know, what we're educating businesses is you're, you're really transferring out a long-term debt at, at a pretty low rate for really short-term money at even a lower rate. But we want to make sure those use of proceeds. So again, the two programs can be applied for, but what we won't do is use an idle loan to take care of payroll and then give you a paycheck protection loan to take care of payroll. So the use of proceeds have to be different and your lender can help monitor that. So you guys can have a discussion on how do you help maximize your forgiveness while you're looking at these two pots of money. Yeah, Dana, let me uh, add one more thing. And, and um, Edward covered this at the very beginning. Remember, now, if you have a PPP loan or if you got an idle loan, uh, good for you. Uh, but if you are still in the, um, if you're down in the trenches, still trying to hammer out the numbers and, and go through the process of submitting a loan application, we do not have the money yet appropriated. As we said at the outset, uh, it is my strong belief that there will be more money appropriated by Congress, though that hasn't happened yet. The Senate took it up last week. They came to no resolution. They've adjourned for the weekend. They'll come back next week. And my hope is before Tuesday or Wednesday that we have a little more clarity as to what, if anything, is going to be added to those programs. I think there will be money. Um, right now, the Republicans wanted $250 billion for paycheck protection, and only that. Um, the argument on the other side was, if we're going to give you that, then we want more money for state and local governments. We want more money for hospitals. And so that uh, negotiation is going to happen over the weekend, and by the first of the week, we will know. Um, I, I do want to ask um, uh, to kind of expand on this discussion, because I think this is probably the meat and potatoes of of what most of the businesses are tuned in to hear. Uh, Chip, what, what uh, recommendations, um, and maybe that's not the right word, but, but what conversations are you having with your customers relative to uh, EIDL versus PPP uh, documentation and what they should be doing in order to make sure, because I think the attractiveness of PPP is the fact that the loan is forgiven if, in fact, uh, the majority of the money, 75% is spent on payroll uh, with the remaining for other expenses and held within those uh, particular guidelines? Yeah, I think that's definitely the, the PPP, especially for the larger companies with more employees, is undoubtedly a, the, the better product for that. The EIDL, and Edward can maybe speak to this a little bit, but I think there is some, you know, confusion or lack of, uh, you know, communication on whether when somebody actually applied, a lot of the people that, that we have that had applied initially for the EIDL loan still haven't heard anything back on whether they were approved or not. A lot of the ones that seem to be a better fit for EIDL were the small businesses that possibly did not have employees, did not have a payroll and the PPP program didn't accept independent contractor applications until the 10th. So, you know, there was kind of a scramble for what could they do in the short term, and I think a lot of them tried to go the EIDL route, but since that's a direct SBA product, you know, the banks, outside of being aware of the product itself, we weren't involved in that, you know, approval process or communication process. So I'm not sure, Edward, if you have any kind of update on where that stands or if assuming that a customer has applied or somebody has applied for an idle loan if they have not heard anything back at this point does that mean that they did not receive any funds since those have been depleted or what should they do yeah no that's a that's a great question so uh, of course the idle loan is is a, a disaster loan and 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 normally when people think of sba it is a guaranteed loan that they work with their lender to get however in the case of uh, disasters, that's when SBA comes in to do direct lending. Uh, and so once that program was authorized here in Arkansas, they opened up uh, the application system. That application system quickly took on uh, thousands and thousands of applications. In that process, SBA did shut down the original application system and start up a new application system, a streamlined, simplified application system to reduce um, basically the, the amount of forms and documents that the small business was going to have to provide when they really understood the scope and magnitude of this disaster. 
Uh, so those applicants that applied and had a successful application number, they're really just to hold on now and SBA will be contacting them uh, is what we're being told from our Office of Disaster Assistance. Now, there's two different uh, aspects. If, if you applied on the original application and you had an application number put in, you should be good and the SBA will contact you. If you applied under the Streamline application, that's when SBA introduced and uh, the CARES Act was authorized, so it was allowed to fund advance options. That's the idle advance. And that was the up to $10,000 um, advance on your idle loan. What that was based off of, or, and, and it wasn't necessarily uh, communicated as clearly in the beginning, but that, that $10,000 advance was based on how many employees that the, the uh, business reported in that um, application process. So if you reported zero employees, you would've got a $1,000 advance. If you uh, reported 10 employees, you would've got a $10,000 advance. So what the SBA and Office of Disaster Assistance is telling uh, their customers now is you should be, if you did apply for the advance, you should be watching your account that you put your direct deposit information in. They will direct deposit the information without any notice. So it will just be direct deposited into that account. If you are approved for an economic injury disaster loan, a loan officer from the SBA will reach out directly to you to establish additional communication and an account so they can fund your loan. So that's currently where we're at on the economic injury disaster loan process. I know we have a ton of folks calling us to saying, hey, I need to check in where my application is at. But unfortunately at the district office, we do not have access to those loan applications or to find out where you're at in that program. What, uh, what we can do is get you over to the 1-800 number so you can call directly in or send them an email and I'll make sure we get that 1-800 number in the chat for everybody as well. And I think you touched on it earlier, but one of the most important things that the business owners need to know is if they applied for an idle loan but have not received proceeds yet, but have taken and received proceeds for a PPP loan, if they get those idle proceeds, they need to be sure to contact their bank immediately so they can work with them on the best way to utilize those funds so that it doesn't impact the forgiveness on the PPP side. Yeah, you're 100% right. I think that's that's the best way. Until we uh, do see some additional guidance from SBA on exactly how forgiveness is going to be handled, those businesses really need to kind of mind their P's and Q's and make sure they are talking with their banker because, um, you know, their banker ultimately is given delegated authority under the PPP program to really monitor and work with them on those funds so they can maximize that forgiveness because I know that's really the intent uh, of the uh, the legislation uh, and so we want to help them do that as well and, and our banks are set up in a fantastic position to do that. Dana, before we leave the subject of SBA uh, on this particular discussion, um, please allow me as a point of personal privilege to say this. I, I hope it wasn't lost on the people viewing this, what Edward said a few minutes ago about how many applications and the volume of work that has transpired over two weeks. They've done 14 years worth of loans in 14 days. Now, I don't think there's anybody, even Edward on this call, would not disagree with the fact that the SBA has typically been a, a, a little bit um, more, um, I don't want to use the word difficult, but it is a, uh, the SBA process has long had a reputation of being uh, pretty bureaucratic and it takes a while. Um, but to see what the SBA, Administrator Kranz and the people have done in the organization relative to the intent of Congress and how quickly they've been able to get this money out the door and helping small business has been nothing short of miraculous in my strong opinion and i just want to credit them for the work that they've done and chip i know you'd agree with that i would yeah it, it's taken you know i say it here all the time but it's it's literally taken every person has taken every agency edward and i are on a call together uh, every day you know it's when you roll out an 800 page bill and, and you try to make the rules as you go it's very difficult 
Um, but the SBA has been good to give the banks the authority to get the money out the door. And all the banks have worked extremely hard, all of them, all the bankers. have. It's just it's taken a just a Herculean effort to get this done. And, you know, I think we've increased our total number of loans by about 9% and our total outstanding volume by close to 10% in that short time period. So it's just uh, the effort has been there by all parties to get the money out the door, and it's it's been a positive thing to see. really has been a positive thing to see all all the agencies working together to get this done and all the small businesses taken care of in a timely manner. Um, it definitely has not been a small feat. So uh, congrats and thanks to both of your organizations. Um, you guys, during your dialogue, you addressed several of the questions that we have presented but we do still have a couple uh, remaining. Uh, the next one that's coming up is uh, how does the PPP and employer tax credit work? Am I allowed to use both options? Edward, I'll yield to you. Oh, you want to? Okay, great. Um, so the employer tax credit, if I'm not mistaken, is, is that, uh, and for clarification. That's the treasury program. That's the IRS treasury program. Yeah, so yeah, SBA and, and uh, Treasury has released some, some uh, additional guidance on that in the FAQs. Um, so federal, fe federal dollars are really not, um, uh, we tend not to commingle. They don't like being next to each other, we like to say, in, in any kind of um, uh, proceeds that are coming from an SBA loan. So those are not going to be considered. Uh, and let me go ahead and see if I can pull up the actual verbiage off of our FAQ to make sure. Uh, those are going to be excluded and not eligible for the forgiveness component if you are receiving other duplicative federal benefits on top of that. That'd be the easiest way to say it. Okay. So they could potentially utilize both programs. They just can't be used for the same wages. That's correct. Okay. Um, and then our next one, um, I'm a small business owner, LLC. Should I apply for a loan as a sole proprietor? Jeff, that's probably that in your area. Yeah, Edward can, can jump in if he needs to, but the uh, part of that's going to depend on if, if the LLC actually has wages that it pays to other employees. If the LLC does employ other people and has wages, then it would need to apply as, as an LLC for the PPP loan. If it does not, and it's truly a sole proprietor and there are no other wages, then they would apply as an independent contractor. When you apply as an independent contractor, you're going to be required, and this came out just a couple days ago in some of the additional FAQs, but you're going to be required to submit a Schedule C from your 2019 tax return. If you have not filed your tax return, you can still prepare the Schedule C section. And what will be used for your wages calculation is basically the line 31 of the Schedule C, which is your net income. So they're going to assume the net income as the equivalent of annual wages, and that will be used in your formula. So if you employ people and you pay wages, then you apply as an LLC for the loan. If not, you'd apply as an independent contractor and you'd use that Schedule C. Perfect. Um, our next question, uh, and I think we addressed a portion of it earlier, but are most banks now up and running to process loans? Uh, my bank seems to have had some difficulty. Um, my PPP loan application was just updated on Wednesday. If my loan doesn't get processed before funds run out, which we know it has, um, will my application be first in line once and if expanded funding is approved or will I have to reapply? Yeah, I would say that um, the first thing you need to do is communicate with your loan officer, whoever your point of contact was on that. And a lot of times, you know, when a when a customer submits an application, it doesn't mean that it's been, quote, accepted to the point of being able to be processed. So depending on if that was truly uploaded in the SBA system, um, then it potentially could have had a loan number assigned. But 
I think what most banks are doing, uh, virtually everybody had applications that they had received that weren't at a point of being able to upload for SBA authorization. And it appears that they're continuing to work with those customers that had already submitted applications to be sure that they have those applications completed and at the point that they can submit for SBA authorization, assuming that the funding does become available. But you, you should not have to reapply, but you would need to communicate with your bank to determine exactly where they were. Okay, perfect. And Dana, I am absolutely confident. Look, I don't want people to leave here today knowing that the, the funds have run dry on uh, idle and on PPP. I don't want people to walk away thinking, well, that was a lost opportunity. You, you need to continue to go through the process with your lender because I'm absolutely confident that Congress is going to uh, replenish the fund. The number that we're talking about is $250 billion, not quite as much as the first time around, but that would be a sizable infusion of capital into a, an already very popular program. And I, want pe I don't want to discourage people from going through the process because uh, of its popularity. I do believe that Congress will, in fact, restore the funding. Right. That's good news. I'm sure a lot of our small businesses will be happy to hear that. Now, yeah, as we look down the road, I want to say one more thing. As we look down the road, because this, this is going to come up once uh, once Congress acts on payroll protection program again, there's already discussion about what's going to happen down the road, maybe a fourth tranche of, of congressional action regarding coronavirus. And I know there is kind of some growing sentiment that, uh, that maybe Republicans are going to be opting to want to pursue more of a, um, of, of a, forgiveness on the on, on, on the 941 piece of this thing, the uh, the withholdings, uh, the uh, savings that would go directly into the pockets of the uh, person employed, uh, and also the savings that go into the business that pays the matching part of FICA. Uh, we were on a conference call the other day about that prospect, and I know it's something that guys like Art Laffer and Stephen Moore are promoting. The president has talked about it ad nauseum, and I, and I think that there is a growing sentiment that rather than continue down the road of this unemployment compensation uh, and the disparity between um, uh, the amount that somebody from Arkansas can get right now with that $600 benefit versus, uh, you know, just the savings on the, on the matchings, which, which amounts to basically a 7.5% increase in wages to that uh, discriminating worker. Um, I think there's a chance that we could go down that road the next time, as opposed to doing more of what we have just done. But again, that's in the uh, that's in the category of wait and see. Congress has to come back and start discussing a little bit more as we reopen the government. Some of these decisions will become a little more clear. I also want to add, I think um, that as we look at, of course, Funding under the CARES Act for, for the Paycheck Protection and IDLE are, are two components. There's some additional components that I really want to make sure uh, we, we get in here. Uh, and that's, that's the um, uh, SBA's ability to pay uh, existing SBA loans, 7A, 504, and micro loans under the debt relief provision. And that's uh, uh, 1112, uh, Section 1112 in the CARES Act. That allows SBA to go ahead and make payments on behalf of the borrowers for up to six months uh, on those existing 7A, 504, and micro loan, which is another tool that our businesses really need to take advantage of. Where, uh, you know, traditionally, as we talked about, how many lenders are up and operating in, in Arkansas? Right now, we pretty much have every lender uh, that's activated uh, in, in Arkansas. Uh, doing SBA prior to the CARES Act initiative, though, we had about uh, 35 to 40 lenders that were active in SBA. So those 40 lenders uh, that make up, you know, on average two to, to 300 loans a year under SBA, they have the ability to make sure they're working with their borrowers and getting them the six months of debt relief under the uh, additional care provision in there as well. So uh, if, if you're a small business and, and you have an existing SBA 7A loan, a 504 loan, or a micro loan, you need to contact your lender 
today uh, and and um, as of Monday, um, we're opening up the, the reports that those lenders need to submit to us so we can start paying those loans on behalf of the borrowers uh, under the CARES Act provision 1112. Hey, Edward, is there also on new SBA 7A non-PPP loans that are taken out between now and September that the SBA will pay payments on those loans as well? Though, yes, yeah, so that's under uh, Act 1112 uh, under the CARES Act. And so we've got guidance uh, that we just released out on that uh, this morning uh, and Monday, we're following up uh, with some additional uh, training for our lenders to make sure they're aware on how exactly to use that, that program internally. Okay, we have a couple more questions and we are almost done. Um, what are the options for a hair salon owner? Would I apply for an EIDL since I don't have employees? Am I still eligible for unemployment for myself and EIDL for the expenses related to my business? I think you answered a portion of that earlier. So, yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at that one. I think there's a couple components here that I would uh, just throw caution on before we do kind of give, uh, and, and this would be suggestions, um, is if, if you're a, if you work in a salon or a salon owner, you know, the, the totality of that is, are you running out other booths? That's some consideration. Do you have lost rent wages or lost rental income, or is it just earned income uh, that you're looking to replace? So that's um, also a provision. The economic injury disaster loan program would be a better loan program for those lost rents. If you are just running booths in that salon. And you're the primary, let's say, um, owner, uh, and you do some hairdressing on the side. Uh, economic injury disaster loan would probably be the way to go. Um, you would get on the idle advance a thousand dollar advance, which would be for uh, non repayable, basically a grant, uh, as well as then um, uh, up to twenty five thousand dollar unsecured line of credit uh, to help uh, on those lost rental wages you have from the salon. Now, if you're an active salon owner and, and you have employees um, that are in the business, the paycheck protection, or if you really are an independent contractor uh, and you're doing that yourself, the paycheck protection uh, may be a good provision, but they're gonna look at your net income uh, from the 2019 and divide that by 12. Uh, so, you know, if your net income last year was, was, uh, let's say $12,000, they're going to divide that by 12 to give you an average monthly of a thousand dollar payroll expense, multiply that by two and a half. And so that would be the total loan amount or 2,500 is what you would be eligible for. And then they would allow forgiveness for up to eight weeks on that $2,500. So the $2,000 would be forgivable as direct wages. Dana, there was also, um, Chip did a pretty good job a minute ago of discussing uh, the sole proprietor, the Schedule C type person. Um, there is discussion right now, and I think I uh, said this at the beginning, there's discussion about in the next tranche, if there will be some changes made to the law regarding farmers, the sole proprietors in the, um, in the ag community, the Schedule F kind of guys, Edward, are you hearing any discussion about uh, the prospect of any changes that might come down the road that would uh, benefit the, the types I mentioned here in the ag community? You know, uh, so one of the one of the first questions we needed addressed and we needed clear guidance from SBA was uh, traditionally under uh, SBA 7A authority, which is where this program was kind of modeled and housed under. Um, Farmers row crops are not eligible, um, but uh, what we, we found out shortly uh, after that is we did clearance from SBA that row crops are eligible. And so that really included all agricultural industry under the PPP, uh, which was a fantastic um, goal. And I think that was the goal of uh, Congress in order to, to maximize uh, eligibility under this program. So, um, Luckily, a, a lot of those individual farmers then are eligible on the independent contractor. I thought, think what we saw uh, on the first wave of this was a lot of the large employer-based businesses really get first crack 
uh, up to bat. And I think that's where um, a lot of the funding went. I don't think, uh, at least across Arkansas, we've really gotten to the independent contractor and the self-employed individual as thoroughly, um, you know, with, with applications opening up for them on the 10th. I think we've got a significant uh, group of those folks uh, that are really gonna need access to uh, additional relief, whether it's under PPP uh, or unfortunately under um, you know, unemployment benefits. That's very helpful. I think um, uh, the, the only, the only, I'm sorry, another factor I'd, I'd put into that is, is uh, and I know, you know, our banking institution uh, we've got a lot of small community banks and some of those other ones that traditionally would not be qualified under SBA. There has been some uncertainty about whether they're qualified or not. Uh, and until, you know, additional guidance is really released, um, our, our community banks, our, our uh, improvement districts and things of that nature uh, are kind of left out um, to say uh, it's it's up to the lender if they're willing to take it in. but. Until there's additional guidance and, and support for them, I think that's the uh, known factor that we have. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, I am a restaurant owner and have already laid off my workers. When do I need to bring workers back to avoid issues with the forgive forgiveness? What happens if I do not use the entire amount of my loan because of the drop in business? Do I have to pay interest from the date of the loan for the portion not used, or am I able to return return it since I may not need it? Edward, what are the mechanics for that? Uh, yeah, you know what? I'm going to pass this one right along to Chip since we've given him delegated lending delegated. status uh, and let him weigh in. And then uh, if, if you want, I'll, I'll come back in and, and give my thoughts as well, Chip. Yeah, I appreciate that, Edward. <laughs> um, <laughs> The the issue of bringing your workers back is going to start, I mean, the clock starts ticking for the eight weeks as soon as the loan is funded. So it doesn't have anything to do with the application date or when they've said that, that you're approved. It has to do with when the date that the loan's actually funded. So they're going to start measuring your employment from that day for the next eight weeks compared to employment and payroll for the period that was used in determining the loan amount, which in most cases is 2019. Um, as far as unused portion, and, until we have further, and we kind of touched on this with the restaurant example in the beginning, you know, my understanding, for instance, if a person, you know, qualified for a $100,000 loan, PPP loan, but they only had $70,000 in eligible expenses, provided that they weren't discounted anything because of drastic drops of, you know, in, in their payroll and in their actual number of employees, they would be forgiving for that amount. And then in theory, they would have the unused balance still sitting in their checking account because it's not to be used for anything other than eligible expenses. And at the end of that eight week period, when they go to determine the actual forgiveness, if less than the entire amount is forgiven, then less than the entire amount should have been used, and they would just immediately pay that loan back. The interest, you know, it's a 1% interest. So if you're talking 1% interest on nine or 10 weeks, um, you know, that's not gonna be significant. And SBA, until we get further guidance on how the actual forgiveness and interest section is gonna be handled, you know, I, I can't speak to that exactly, but, you know, if somebody handles the funds appropriately, they're only using them for eligible expenses. And so if they don't utilize that entire loan amount, they should have those funds still in cash and would just pay the balance of the loan off at the end of that time. And if they don't, Chip, is that uh, the balance? Is that just a 1% rate for the next uh, remaining part of the two years uh, cheap interest loan? Yes, it is. Most of the, you know, in the SBA's is kind of given guidance on how those should be set up. Most of those are going to be set up where the balance is to be amortized over the remaining 18 months of that loan term. Yeah, so so you're absolutely right there. And I think uh, that's going to give us six months to really assess the situation before any payments are going to be due to any of these businesses in the first place. So that uh, immediately upon dispersal, they'll have six months before they're required to make any payments. 
Um, and SBA is set up uh, in seven weeks as, as really the flag in the sand for uh, us to even look at forgiveness on these loans. Uh, so we need to see that next upcoming seven weeks and what that looks like. I understand, and you're not, uh, this isn't the first restaurant that I've heard from. I think that's a big challenge with a lot of our restaurants um, and also uh, businesses that are really uh, open to the public is they've got to respond to the CDC requirements uh, and maintain safe social distancing practices and all the other factors. So I think as, um, uh, as we move forward with this, we'll get additional guidance when I think all of the known factors are coming through. But uh, to go back to what uh, the congressman said earlier, this is, you know, this was done pretty quick. Um, from the legislation being passed and approved to the funds getting out the door, we're talking, you know, a little under uh, 20 days total time. So um, I think there's a lot of factors that uh, we're going to see additional guidance be put out to help clarify a lot of the issues as we move forward and really find out what all the, the individual concerns and the um, uh, one-offs are on this. Dana, we've been talking mainly about the Paycheck Protection Program, EIDL, and what's happening under SBA. And I think Edward's done a great job. Chip's done a great job explaining that. Clint over there at AEDC, he's been very patient, uh, kind of tucked away over there uh, without a lot to say. But I, I think it would be healthy for these purposes today uh, to give him an opportunity to, be, because I know AEDC has been right in the middle of this whole unemployment scenario. And, um, and so we're at kind of a, a bit of a, a crossroads here. What, you know, what, what does a business do? Does a business move toward unemployment? Does a business move toward PPP, assuming there's going to be more money? And, and I think it would be healthy to give Clint an opportunity to kind of help us understand uh, the difficulty in this uh, whole unemployment uh, scenario based on, uh, based on what Congress has passed. Thank you, Congressman. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, yeah, you know, shortly after uh, March 11th with Arkansas's first COVID-19 case, we had a meeting with our team and came to an understanding that just like everybody else, we're going to drop our job titles. We're going to become the COVID-19 business assistance response team. We put together a website uh, that I'll put in the chat box. It's ArkansasEDC.com slash COVID-19. We wanted to be a good resource for uh, people and for companies around the state. Since that time, we've had about 87,000 visitors to that site. Uh, we set up our front desk as a hotline for business assistance programs. Uh, since, that, since that time, we've received about 1,200 calls and emails that we've logged, uh, that we've had a team reaching out to companies. And, and we're so incredibly thankful for the CARES Act, uh, for you, Congressman, our congressional delegation has been great to work with. Edward has been fantastic to work with. We've been on a lot of these type calls together. Uh, appreciate bankers like Chip around the state. Uh, I certainly can appreciate all the work that, that went into these uh, 21,700 or so loans across the state of Arkansas. As, as we converted a portion of the governor's quick action closing fund and some funds from the attorney general's office into a bridge loan program, we were able to provide about 250 bridge loans of up to $25,000 to uh, companies around the state. I think with, with that bridge loan program, we, we were able to provide loans to companies in 55 counties of the state. And uh, the, the work that our team put in to, to that amount, uh, you know, I, I can only imagine, uh, you know, what goes on with, with all the work of the bankers around Arkansas and around the United States. So, so certainly, you know, my uh, appreciation goes, goes to those folks, but I, I'll put these resources uh, on the chat box, our website, our phone number. We have a team of people that uh, be more than happy to talk through uh, some scenarios, whether it be the shared work program, uh, help direct as, as we can to federal programs, to the state programs of the governor's quick action closing program and what we have available there. Uh, the governor asked us to allocate a certain portion of what we had set aside uh, in our community development block grant program uh, to fund rural hospitals around the state. So we're getting those funds out and uh, with the resources that, that we've been given, uh, helping, trying to help uh, these companies to retain as many jobs as possible. Uh, we're in a fortunate situation 
that the economy has been good uh, for a long time, so our UI reserves are very healthy. Uh, it's able to withstand a lot of this. Uh, we've not seen near the, the numbers that some other states have. As I mentioned, I think we're at about 150,000 uh, claimants for, for UI uh, in the state right now. And, uh, you know, we're, we're here to, to help companies as we can and uh, certainly hope to, uh, to, to get back to, to a normalized economy as soon as possible. If I could mention one other thing, it's it's uh, part of our website and a part of a social media campaign that we're doing. We're, we're doing our best to highlight companies around the state that have really stepped up in this COVID-19 fight. There are so many companies that we should all be proud of that are just doing some incredibly innovative things, uh, whether it be retooling to make hand sanitizer and, and, uh, and, and other uh, PPE to, uh, to to really just treating their employees great during this time, giving back to the community. So uh, uh, just really want to highlight these companies that are going above and beyond and contributing to the fight. Yeah, and Clint, I got to tell you, uh, Secretary Preston, uh, you guys' entire team uh, has been a steady hand in in this whole thing, and you're the you're among the unsung heroes out here that are helping guide our Kansans through this maze of difficulty during an unprecedented national emergency. And I just want to thank you for that. And please share that with Mike Preston. Uh, and I'll make sure that I share that with the governor as I try to do most often. Thank you, sir. Will do. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I think uh, that concludes the questions that we had presented. Um, so on behalf of the Russellville Chamber of Commerce, uh, I want to thank our presenters for taking the time out today. Danny, um, may, may I also give, can I, can I give my, I want to give my number again. Uh, this is Congressman Womack. Should anybody on this, uh, on this uh, program have a question about the laws passed by Congress or um, need to get a, a, a little bit more determination as to what their particular case is, or if you have other issues related to the federal government, unrelated to the coronavirus, but just, you know, needing help with the VA or Social Security or whatever the case is, the number you should call is 202-225-4301. That's my DC number. And these numbers, th this number is being answered in my district and by my team in Washington round the clock, 202-225-4301. And uh, whoever answers the phone is going to be able to triage your question and get it to the right person. Jeff Hempelman is my legislative director. So if it's related to policy, Jeff will probably be that person. If it's going to be related to constituent service, it's probably going to be coming to Janet Foster or Gilly Brandolini or somebody else. Uh, in my uh, Arkansas office, 202-225-4301. And we look forward to hearing from you uh, and just want you to be safe and, and uh, remain Arkansas strong through this whole process. Thank you, Congressman. I know that's a very valuable tool, uh, resource for our listeners. Um, there again, if you have any issues or if you've missed that number, reach out to the Chamber of Commerce and we'll be happy to share that information with you. Um, we hope that you found the CARE Act update and Q&A presentation helpful and relevant to your small business concerns. Thanks, everyone, and have a great evening. Go Cyclones. Cyclones.